Welcome back. We are talking today about Gilbert Ryle's critique of not just Descartes' mind-body dualism, but of mentalistic accounts of human nature and human behavior, uh, mentalistic accounts of personhood uh, taken more generally. Um, Ryle, remember, comes from what's called the Ordinary Language School of Philosophy, according to which philosophical problems are nothing more than the fruit of linguistic confusion. Uh, that is, the, the ordinary language philosophers believe that there are no genuine philosophical problems. The philosophical problems aren't, for example, like problems in science, um, where the problems are real and, and there are solutions for those problems. Rather, the ordinary language philosophers thought that, that philosophical problems are the result of misunderstanding the many different ways in which words can be used uh, and the very different very many different meanings that words have depending upon their use. Um, that is, there is a, the, the, the ordinary language philosophers believe that, that, that what philosophy traditionally has done is impose dilemmas, paradoxes, black and white scenarios on what really is a, a sort of a, a, a multicolored palette of different possible ways of speaking uh, uh, and different possible uh, meanings and, and understandings. So, 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 so for, for the ordinary language philosophers, philosophy is not a genuine subject area. It is a subject area whose, whose, whose content is the result of uh, linguistic misunderstanding. What we're talking about specifically here is the uh, mind-body problem. And the mind-body problem, remember, is simply the name for um, all of those philosophical problems that arise out of uh, dualistic and mentalistic views of persons and of behavior. Um, so whether we're talking about the problem of other minds, how do we know whether anyone else is thinking, whether we're talking about the problem of mind-body interaction, um, these are all problems that Ryle thinks have no solution because they're not genuine problems. They are problems that arise out of linguistic confusion, specifically um, linguistic con confusion over the way in which mentalistic words function in ordinary uh, speech, in ordinary language. The specific kind of linguistic confusion that Ryle thinks is involved in the mind-body problem uh, is what Ryle calls a category mistake. And uh, a category mistake is defined as a linguistic error in which one mistakes one type of word for another. And typically, category mistakes occur when the superficial grammar of a word or of a sentence betrays actually a radically different kind of logical form. So for example, you might have two sentences, each, in, each of subject predicate form, but in one sentence, the verb plays a very different kind of role from the role that the verb plays in another sentence. But on the surface, they look similar, and so one can mistakenly interpret uh, the sentences as being of, of essentially the same kind. I, I know this is very abstract, but it will become clearer in a moment when we give examples. Um, Ryle thinks that the mind-body problem, all these clusters of, this cluster of problems that arise in response to, uh, as a result of uh, mentalistic and dualistic views of, 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 of persons and of, of, of human behavior, um, that, that, that the kind of linguistic mistake that, under, that, that underlies all of these philosophical problems is uh, the category mistake. Now, Ryle gives some very nice examples of category mistakes. And what's nice about them is they're not only examples of category mistakes per se, but they are examples that are illustrative of the type of category mistake that uh, occurs uh, with the mind-body problem, that underlies the mind-body problem. So the examples that I'm going to discuss are on pages 16 to 17 of your readings from Ryle. Um, he gives two examples of illustrations of the kind of category mistake he's talking about. The first is I'm going to call the university example, and the second I'm going to call the military parade example. Um, 
And so let's just sort of, we'll just walk through each of the examples. I'll, I'll, I'll read here uh, bits and pieces from, from the examples, and, and, and we'll talk about uh, their relevance to uh, the kind of the category mistake that underlies the mind-body problem. So first, the university example, <coughs> um, page 16. Quote, a foreigner visiting Oxford or Cambridge, of course, these are the great English universities, ancient English universities, for the first time is shown a number of colleges, libraries, playing fields, museums, scientific departments, and administrative offices. Right, so you can imagine somebody's on a tour of the university. Um, if you don't like Oxford or Cambridge, imagine someone's on a, on a tour of Missouri State. And you show them Strong Hall, and you show them uh, Carrington, and you show them uh, Plaster Student Union, and so on and so forth. He then asks, the person on the tour then asks, but where is the university? I have seen where the members of the colleges live, where the registrar works, where the scientists experiment and the rest, but I have not yet seen the university in which reside and work the members of your university. All right, so you imagine that, you, that you know, you, somebody, you're taking someone on a tour of, 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 of Missouri State and you show them all the buildings, you show them the playing fields, you show them uh, 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 the classrooms, and then they say, that's great that you showed me all these things, but you haven't showed me the university yet. Rao goes on to say, it has then to be explained to him that the university is not another collateral institution, some ulterior counterpart to the colleges, laboratories, and offices which he has seen. The university is just the way in which all that he has seen is organized. When they are seen, and when their coordination is understood, the university has been seen. He was mistakenly al allocating the university to the same category as that to which the other institutions belong. So, so here we have a classic example of a category mistake, of a person who doesn't understand the way that the word university is used as opposed to words like Strong Hall, words like um, Carrington Hall, words like Plaster Student Union. Right? Words like Plaster Student Union, Strong Hall, refer to concrete entities. These are nouns that refer to actual objects, things. The word university, though also a noun, has a very different kind of meaning. It doesn't refer to a concrete object, to an individual thing. It refers to a specific type of relationship between objects. The university, in a sense, is the relationship between the various buildings, institutions, etc., etc., etc. And so someone who wasn't properly attuned to the way that the noun university is used in contrast to nouns like strong hall uh, and such would commit this, this sort of category mistake. And might, if, you want, if we want to now sort of anticipate the way that Ryle is going to use this concept with respect to uh, the mind-body problem, um, a person might who may commits this category mistake might think that, well, because I can't see the university the way I can see Strong Hall, the university must be a non-physical entity. Right? So in addition to there being buildings and playing fields and dormitories, there are also these non-physical entities called universities. Right? So what we have here is an example of the way that a linguistic error a misinterpretation of a word because of its superficial grammatical similarity to other kinds of words can lead a person to create a philosophical problem where none exists, right? And as opposed to, you know, in comparison with the mind-body problem, we might talk about the university buildings problem, right? So, well, how does this non-physical entity, the university, interact with these physical buildings, playing fields, and dormitories? Right? So, so, so the idea here is to illustrate kinds of certain kinds of category mistakes that that reveal the kind of category mistake that's being committed um, in the case of the mind-body problem. And when we and when I finish talking about the examples, we'll we'll, we'll talk explicitly about the way that the mind-body pro problem. Um, commits exactly the same kind of category mistake as those we're representing in the examples. Let's take the, se the second example, which is the, um, the military parade example. So continuing on. The same mistake would be made by a child witnessing the march past of a division. 
So you imagine, you know, you're a kid uh, you're with a kid at a military parade. Who, having had pointed out to him such and such battalions, batteries, squadrons, etc., asked when the division was going to appear. Right, so you imagine you're watching a parade and this company walks by and that battalion walks by and this regiment walks by and then the person asks you, well, where's the division? When's the division coming? He would be supposing that a division was a counterpart to the units already seen, partly similar to them and partly unlike them. He would be shown his mistake by being told that in watching the battalions, batteries, and squadrons marching past, he had been watching the division marching past. The march past was not a parade of battalions, batteries, squadrons, and a division. It was a parade of the battalions, batteries, and squadrons of a division. And once again, notice how this sort of linguistic error could produce a philosophical problem where there really is none. So the person who thinks that the word division must refer to a concrete thing, just like the word squadron A refers to a concrete thing, that person might be inclined to become a dualist about divisions versus squadrons or divisions versus individual soldiers. We have here an example of a category mistake, a person who thinks that because the word division grammatically, superficially resembles other nouns, that it must be the same kind of noun and must have the same kind of reference. Okay. <clears throat> now, Ryle's argument is that we commit exactly this kind of category mistake with respect to mentalistic words, to our mentalistic vocabulary. We think that mentalistic words refer to mental entities and processes, refer to thoughts and minds, when in fact they do not. As he says on page 16, the dualist and, and, and by extension the mentalist represent the facts of mental life as if they belong to one logical type or category when they actually belong to another. The dogma is therefore a philosopher's myth. Okay. So what he wants to say is, we commit exactly the same kind of category mistake with respect to our mentalistic vocabulary as is committed in both the university example and in the military parade example. So let's go, let's go now directly to the... Um, Example, ment examples of, ment of, of the use of mentalistic words in order to see um, how this mistake is made. So consider the following example. I'm going to give you two sentences. One, um, one describes a behavior and one allegedly describes a thought. Okay. So the first sentence is, John hit Bill. The second sentence is, John hates Bill. Now, in the first sentence, the verb refers to a physical action, the action of hitting someone. So what the sentence is telling me is that one person struck another. Now, the second sentence has an identical grammatical structure. And the word hates looks like it plays exactly the same role in the sentence as the word hit plays in the first. The idea is that since hit describes a physical action of John's, we assume that the word hates describes a mental action of John's, a thought. Right? So, so what I'm describing to you is the way that the category mistake is committed. Right? We see a sentence like John hit Bill, and we understand what that means. We understand how to interpret the word hit. We see a sentence like John hates Bill, and we think that it's to be interpreted in precisely the same way. That since the word hit refers to a physical action, the word hates must refer to a mental action, to a thought. Okay. Let's consider some more examples just to sort of make this clear. So the first, uh, I'm, I'm going to pair a sentence described that describes a physical action with a sentence that purports to describe a uh, mental action, and, 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 I will, and I will label the first uh, type of sentence a uh, behavioral sentence, and the second type of sentence a mentalistic sentence, okay? 
So here's the first behavioral sentence. John kissed Jill. Here's the first mentalistic sentence. John loves Jill. Here's the second behavioral sentence. John drank a glass of water. Here's the second mentalistic sentence. John is thirsty. Here's the third behavioral sentence. John voted against George Bush. Here's the third mentalistic sentence. John thinks that George Bush is the worst president ever. If you like, you can substitute any president you want. I just picked on George Bush because he's the current one. Now, in each case, there is a temptation to think of the sentence in the second column along the same lines as the sentence in the first. In other words, because of the grammatical similarity between a sentence like John kissed Jill and a sentence like John loves Jill, there is the temptation to interpret both sentences the same way. And since the, the verbs in the behavioral sentences denote physical activities of various kinds, we assume that the verbs in the mentalistic sentences refer to mental activities of various kinds. And this leads us to imagine two separate realms, the realm of behavior on the one hand, the realm of physics on, that, on, the, on the one hand, and the realm of thought on the other, the mental realm on the other. And we may, in, we may interpret these two realms dualistically as Descartes does, or simply as two dual aspects of the same thing as John Locke does, but in either case, because we've, we see these types of sentences as just having the same grammatical structure, we assume that they have the same meaning, the same logical structure, and this leads us to um, a view, uh, the view that there are, in a sense, mental action, behavioral actions on the one hand, mental actions on the other. Okay. And, and, and Ryle is, uh, Ryle, one of the nice things about Ryle is, is how clear he is and how clearly he writes. If you look on page 19, he says exactly this in a very, very pithy uh, short sentence. Top of page 19, he says, Since mental conduct words are not to be construed as signifying the occurrence of mechanical processes, they must be construed as signifying the occurrence of non-mechanical processes. Right? So there he, he very neatly sums up the mistake that we make. We see two words playing a very similar role grammatically in a sentence, and we assume that they must play the same logical role in the sentence, that they must have the same meaning. In this case, we assume that behavioral verbs, since behavioral ver verbs refer, refer to physical actions, mentalistic verbs must refer to mental actions, and this gives us the impression that there are two realms of being, the realm of physical being, the realm of mental being. However, we construe that duality, whether in the, in the, in the literally dualistic way that, that Descartes does, or in the sort of descriptive dualism that Locke prefers. Ryle's argument, and it's an awfully original argument, um, this is one of those, uh, Ryle's is one of those arguments where even if you think it's absolutely wrong, you have to admire it for its ingenuity, for its cleverness, and for its perceptiveness, for how it sees things um, that perhaps a less perceptive person would not notice, someone less a genius than Ryle would not notice. Ryle argues that the assumption that the mentalistic sentences and the behavioral sentences are essentially the same, that beyond their surface grammar, that their logic, their meaning is essentially the same, he says that that assumption is a mistake. That to, to, to make that assumption is to commit the category mistake that then produces the position, the mentalistic position that produces the mind-body problem. But it's one thing to say that something is, that, 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 that to make a certain comparison is a mistake, or that to take, to, 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 to be convinced that two sentences are similar is a mistake. The question, you know, then is bed, well, A, why is it a mistake? And B, what is the correct way of understanding these sentences? And of course, Ryle has an answer for this. Ryle says that unlike behavioral verbs, unlike verbs like kissed, drank, voted against. Mentalistic words do not refer to mental objects or to mental activities. Right, so let me say that again. 
Ryle says, look, yes, it is true that behavioral verbs refer to physical activities. So the, wor the verb kissed refers to the act of kissing. The verb drinks refers to the act of drinking. The verb voted against refers to the action of voting against someone. But, he says, mentalistic verbs do not refer in the same way. Mentalistic verbs do not refer to mental object or mental activities. Well, the question is, well, what do they refer to then? What, what does a mentalistic verb mean? And this is where I think his view is quite ingenious. Ryle says, our mentalistic vocabulary is a kind of shorthand for describing people's behavioral dispositions. That is, for describing the behaviors that a person is likely to engage in. He says on page 116 of your reading, quote, to say that a person knows something or aspires to be something, that is, to ascribe a mentalistic verb to a person, is not to say that he is at a particular moment in process of doing or undergoing anything, but that he is able to do certain things when the need arises, or that he is prone to do and feel certain things in situations of certain sorts. The verbs know possess, aspire, and other mentalistic verbs, do not behave like the words run, wake up, or tingle. We cannot say, he knew so-and-so for two minutes, then stopped and started again after a breather. He gradually aspired to be a bishop, or he is now engaged in possessing a bicycle. In other words, what he's saying is, we can tell that mentalistic verbs don't function like behavioral verbs, in what we can't say with them, right? A behavioral verb refers to a physical activity. John runs. And so we can say something like, John started running, but then he stopped for a few minutes, and now he's going to start again. But what Ryle is saying is, you can't say that kind of thing for mentalistic verbs like knowing or understanding. You can't say, well, he knows this, he knew this for five minutes, and then he stopped, and now he's going to start again. What does it mean to say that, 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 that mentalistic verbs refer to behavioral dispositions rather than to mental activities? Well, I think the best way to explain this is simply to give examples again. So my examples now are going to um, involve two categories. The first is going to be what I'm going to call a mental, the first example will be a mentalistic sentence. The second will be that mentalistic sentence translated into the dispositional sentence that it really means. Okay, and this will be clear as the examples come out. So let's take one of the ones that we've already done on um, the mentalistic sentence, John loves Jill. Ryle says that what, this, what we really mean when we say something like John loves Jill is we mean that John is likely to kiss Jill, John is likely to ask Jill out on dates, John is likely to send Jill flowers on Valentine's Day, John is likely to say things to Jill like, I love you. In other words, the word love is a shorthand for all of these behaviors that John is inclined to engage in with respect to Jill. The mentalistic verb, loves, does not refer to a mental action of John's. Rather, it refers to the inclination on John's part to engage in various physical actions. Mental, our mentalistic vocabulary is another way of talking about physical activity. Specifically, it is a dispositional way about spe of speaking about physical activity. Let's take another example that we've already given. John is thirsty. Now, that's the mentalistic sentence. John is thirsty. Once again, Ryle would say, the word is thirsty, the mentalistic word is thirsty, does not refer to a mental state of John. It does not refer to some thought in his head. Rather, when we say John is thirsty, we're employing a kind of shorthand. What we really mean is that John will drink a glass of water or other refreshing liquid if it is offered to him. Again, the mentalistic word does not refer to a mental object or an event. The mentalistic word refers to the physical actions that John is likely to engage in at the moment.
And let's do the last one. John thinks that George Bush is the worst president ever. So this is going to be, again, the mentalistic sentence. And once again, Ra is going to want to say, the, 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 the mentalistic verb thinks that George Bush is the worst president ever doesn't refer to a mental entity in John's head, namely the thought that um, George Bush is the worst president ever. Rather, what this is is a shorthand way of saying that John is likely to vote against George Bush, he's likely to campaign against him, he's likely to stand outside the White House and pick at him, and so on and so forth. So let's sum up for a minute, because, because I know that, that you know, linguistics is not one of those subjects that's taught in high school, uh, neither is philosophy for the most part, and, and this may be, be a very, very, to you, a very odd way of, of thinking about things. And so let's, let's, let's just sort of step back for a minute and re-summarize the position. We have a certain philosophical position. That position we've called mentalism. The view that, in a sense, there exist thoughts, and there exist, physical be there exist behaviors, and the thoughts are the causes of the behaviors. That it is out of these thoughts that our self, our personhood, is comprised. Okay. And that's what we call the mentalistic position. Now, that mentalistic philosoph that, that philosoph philosophical position that we call mentalism spawns a number of philosophical problems that we have deemed under the, the we've put under the rubric the mind body problem. These problems are perennial. That is, philosophers have been debating these problems for as long as there have been philosophers. And incidentally, one of the motivations of the Ordinary Language School of Philosophy was what, perceived to be a, what was perceived to be a lack of progress in the solving of philosophical problems. And so what these, what these, think, what these Ordinary Language philosophers thought was, well, Maybe, there's, maybe there is no answer to the problems. Maybe the problems, are a mis maybe the problems are not real problems. Or maybe the problem is the problems, right? Is the problems themselves. So you've got this position. We call it mentalism. It spawns a bunch of problems that we've called the mind-body problem. These problems are perennial and seem to defy solution. The ordinary language philosophers, and particularly Gilbert Ryle, comes along and says, look, the only reason anybody holds this philosophical position from which these problems arise is due to a confusion about the way that we use our mentalistic vocabulary. That is, we have all of these mentalistic words. And we mistakenly assume that these mentalistic words function like other words, specifically that mentalistic verbs function like behavioral verbs. And so we falsely assume that there is a whole realm of mental objects and mental activities. <coughs> Excuse me. But once we realize that that's not the case, once we realize that mentalistic words do not refer to mental objects and mental activities, but instead are simply a way of, a shorthanded way of referring to, to behavioral dispositions. Once we realize that, we will be no longer inclined to posit the existence of a separate realm of mental objects and mental activities. In other words, we will no longer be tempted to be mentalists. And if we're no longer to be tempted to be, if we're no longer tempted to be mentalists, the mind-body problem never arises. This is not so much the solution of a problem or a set of problems as it is the dissolution of a problem or a set of problems. I'm going to leave it to you to decide whether you find this analysis persuasive. I left you with, last time with a bunch of questions, one of which I believe was, went directly to the question of whether you find this, argue, this argument, these cluster, this cluster of arguments to be persuasive. Um, 
whether you do or not, and I'm not sure that I do, um, uh, as I said, I think uh, it, the, the, the argument is to be admired for its ingeniousness, for its creativity, and for its perceptiveness of certain facts about our ways of speaking. I mean, surely, even if we finally decide at the end of the day that we don't agree with Ryle, that we do think that these mentalistic verbs do refer to mental objects and mental activities, Ryle is surely correct that what, what we've been calling these dispositional sentences, these behavioral dispositions, are certainly implicated by our mentalistic vocabulary, perhaps in ways that we, we've not been previously aware. Now next time we're going to talk about B.F. Skinner, who of course is one of, uh, considered to be one of the founders of the Behaviorist School of Psychology, which remains a powerful uh, intellectual paradigm within psychological theory and especially uh, within clinical practice. Um, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about B.F. Skinner on the subject of minds, persons, freedom, and values. And uh, we're going to have two lectures on Skinner, just like we had two lectures on Ryle. <clears throat> we're going to read from two selections. One is essentially a scientific treatise, and the second is a quasi-political treatise. The first sort of describes the basic arguments for and, and logic of behaviorist, psych, behaviorism and psychology. Um, uh, the second, which is going to be our excerpts from the book uh, Be Beyond uh, Freedom and Dignity, uh, describe what, what Skinner thinks should be the social and political consequences of behaviorist psychology. And I'm going to leave you with three things to think about. The first, what does Skinner believe are the aims of science? And so what, what, is, what does Skinner think science ultimately is for? Two, why does Skinner think that we need specifically a science of man, as he calls it? And three, what exactly does Skinner think is unscientific about the mentalistic concept of a person? Right? So this concept of a person that we've been talking about, whether in its Cartesian or whether in its Lockean form, this essentially mentalistic concept where a person is thought to be comprised of um, uh, his or her various uh, thoughts and other mental states, what does Skinner think is unscientific about this view? It's very important that we understand the basic view that Skinner is putting forward, the scientific view that Skinner is putting forward, before we can fruitfully address um, the social and political program that he wants to base on those scientific views. So that's all for today, uh, for this installment, and uh, we'll see you next time when we take up the subject of B.F. Skinner, and he will be the last um, of, of the topics within this uh, first part of the course, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.